Hi, everybody. I'm Odin. I'm a nerd. I'm even labeled as a nerd for your convenience. Um, in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, template metaprogramming. It's going to be building on last year's talk at this conference, which uh, there's actually a prequel of, which I did later, very Star Wars-y of me. So if you're watching the video, watch Code Dive 2017, C++ Now 2017, and then this one. Um, if you weren't at la last year's talk, don't worry, I will fill in some of the blanks. Um, in last year's talk, we looked at algorithms in template metaprogramming. And this chart, this axis is time it took, and this axis is how many parameters we passed to the algorithm. Right? So low is good. And that one that's almost vertical, that is the reverse algorithm from boost MPL. And then, uh, you know, Hannah is somewhere in the middle here. Uh, these are Louis benchmarks. I'm not sure why Hannah's not on here. Um, this is the fastest uh, thing that is currently in uh, Boost. It is uh, um, uh, Dimoff's uh, um, uh, uh, library. And then here we have uh, BridgeEnd, which I think is at some point going to be proposed to boost. Very much the same strategy uh, as MP11. Um, and then down here at the bottom, we have the library known as Quasir MPL, which I am considering submitting, or I am trying to, for lack of time, have not yet submitted to boost uh, for review. Um, a lot of boost people are in the room here. If uh, you like it, uh, tell me. If you don't like it, I really want to talk to you. <laughs> um, and you know, after, after having written this library and presented it last year, they, I got basically two reactions from people who tried it in their code base. Right? And I really like that guy on the left. Let's put him on a pedestal and let's give him a trophy. Thing is, the guy on the right, uh, he's got a point, right? Especially about the part that I can't draw. But um, algorithms and 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 you know fast algorithms, especially on large parameter packs, are not what most people are doing, right? There are some template addicts who do things like create a, an alternative kernel, which through the magic of metaprogramming can prove that you will never deadlock and you will never starve your high priority processes. This has to do with a lot of algorithmic operations on a lot of parameters. That runs a lot faster. That runs orders of magnitude faster than old TMP. But if you're just waiting for your stuff to Svine, I mean, the number of parameters passed to a meta function on average is probably somewhere between one and two, <laughs> right? So it doesn't really matter that we can do 500 really fast. So this, this talk is less about the crazy people and more about the non-addicted user, right? The person that doesn't particularly like TMP but has to in order to implement their library, right? Because, you know, this is kind of the, 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 the ranking of how long things take, which Keel, my very gifted former intern, teardrop, teardrop, uh, <laughs> um, benchmarked on sort of a custom machine where we could go all the way down to, you know, the cost of uh, looking up a memoized type and things like that, right? And basically, to make algorithms run fast, we only went down to about here, right? And tried to instantiate as few types as possible. We tried to make everything work in aliases. Uh, there will be a little refresher on that in a couple of slides. And so with that, you can get these kinds of results, but what about the non-addicted user who's down the bottom two? Like, I didn't really look at that at all. Uh, I just didn't do it because it's slow. Right? <coughs> so for a little refresher from last year, sort of how, how the um, paradigm has shifted on you know, how we metaprogram in order to make it faster. And I will warn you, this is kind of a, this is not a talk that builds in complexity. It's more of a sawtooth, so we're going to do some deep dives. and if. You know, if I'm going too fast during one of these, wait a couple of slides, I'll pick you back up and we'll go up the next sawtooth, right? So in formal Quasir MPL, 
going to be produced, uh, uh, proposed as boost TMP library. We don't work on lists. We work on packs of parameters, right? So you don't say, you know, sort this list of stuff. You say sort and then give me a pack of stuff, right? Which means you can save creating the list type. Right? So if we want to reverse, uh, you know, a pack of elements, then we use this call alias to call a uh, compile time function object or a meta closure or whatever you want to call this thing. This reverse is some type that has a callable interface, right? That's what it's defined as. It happens to be implemented as, currently, a type that has a nested alias called f, which you can pass things to, right? This is not mandated by the library, uh, which gives us room in the back end to implement this differently over time, right? If your compiler doesn't support nested template aliases and template classes, then we can put in a different implementation that allows for older compilers to use the same front end. And if, you know, in Z++ 2023, we finally get the awesome const expert metaprogramming stuff that runs way faster, we can just swap out the back end. Right? We still pay for the public interface, which is going to be slower than writing it by hand then. But if you write code now in C++11, then your C++11 template metaprogramming could potentially get way faster in future versions. We can just you know, check which com what the compiler supports and then swap out the back end. Right? So current implementation of this uh, reverse type, the, the template reverse, you know, the, the templated struct reverse takes one type as a parameter and it's defaulted to identity. And what this type is, this is the continuation. This is the next thing to happen, right? So if we want to reverse a list and then we want to, I don't know, take off the first couple of elements or something, right? <laughs> then we want to be able to pass a pack of arguments to the next thing. And in every te other template metaprogramming library, you can't do this because passing data to the next thing goes through return. And you can only return one type. So you have to pack it in a list, next thing unpacks it again, and then works on the pack, right? But in this library, you chain things much the same way you do in, in uh, ranges or, or in Haskell point free or wherever. Uh, you pass in the next thing to do, and then you give that thing its next thing to do, and then you just keep propagating the pack of parameters from one thing to the next until there isn't a next thing to do, and then you just return down the whole chain. Right? So we're saving a lot of creating and destroying lists. So the reverse is forwarding all the parameters to an alias in reverse impl, and we're using a const expert meta function, uh, sorry, a const expert function to select based on the size of the pack that we get which specialization of this reverse impl we're passing to. So we can have different fast tracks, they're called. So we can you know, bite off either two or four or eight or you know, powers of two uh, um, at a time and save recursions in reverse impl. Right? So here is the specialization for two and four. With two, we bite off two. With four, we bite off four. The const expr function will select the right one based on the size of t's and then in both of these cases, we recurse again, calling ourselves again. Once we get to one or zero, then we will break recursion and just pass that pack on to the next thing, right? Oops, that was recursion. I'm getting ahead of my slides, right? This identity thing, you know, this, this, sorry, this, this C parameter, we pass that on into the whole recursive monster so that when it's done recursing and has reversed everything, it can just call the next thing with that pack, right? So, oops, my slide. <laughs> oh well. Um, so we can pass to reverse a function that drops the first 10, right? Okay, in this example, dropping 10 out of a list of three is kind of stupid, but that's what you get when you make your slide to the last minute. Uh, <laughs> so this is, a, a, you know, this style of programming, this sort of inside out piping things from one thing to the next is known as a tacit style of programming, right? So, so tacit, not template turns out to be TMP in the end anyway, which is cool. <laughs> uh, you know, probably the most widely known tacit form of expression is on, uh, is, you know, the, 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 you know, piping on a, on a shell, right? Um, 
We also have ranges. If I have you know, a vector of, of vectors of data, I can put this into a range that joins them, pipe that into remove if, pipe that into transform. Right? We're probably somewhat familiar with this uh, syntax from Eric Niebler's library. We want to do the same thing in this metaprogramming library. Well, here I have all of that data again. I can save the outer vector because I have a pack of lists of stuff rather than a vector of vector of stuff. Right? I'm calling my algorithm. First, I'm going to join. Then I'm going to remove if. You know, join takes one parameter. That's what it's piping into, right? Remove if takes two parameters. First one is the predicate. Second one is the thing we're piping into. Predicate will be passed, you know, every parameter once, right? And we want to do uh, a modulo on that. Modulo takes two parameters. Most other libraries will have some bind or bind back, bind front, magic placeholders, whatever, to get around you know, the, 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 the problem of adding uh, you know, previously known fixed parameters to a dynamic call. Right? In this case, we can just push back. Right? We, we, we have a pack of parameters past this thing that has one thing in it. We can push a two to the back of that, pipe that into modulo, pipe the result of that modulo into same as, which just compares whatever it's passed to whatever you uh, gave it as a fixed parameter. Then, once we've removed all of the uh, elements that are uh, not odd, then we can pipe that into transform. Transform also takes a predicate to string. We'll see what that is. That's not actually from in the library. That's, that's our own custom built uh, meta closure in this case. Transform also takes a continuation. So if we had passed it another parameter, it would have piped the result into that. But in this case, we just run a return. That's all that we want to do. So uh, transform's uh, second parameter is defaulted to what's called listify, which just packs everything up into a list and then returns that down the chain. Right. So here's the implementation of toString, because we don't actually have to write that as a meta function. We can implement this in this domain specific language. Right. So, OK, oh my god, right? But, uh, terrible complexity. But if you look at sort of the alternative implementation in normal templates, it's not going to look good either, right? At least this is a uniform uh, DSL for expressing this without any template disambiguators or anything like that, right? So let's go through this. If underscore takes three function objects. First function object is expected to return a Boolean, right? And depending on that Boolean, we are going to pass the same parameters that were passed to us to one of the other two function objects, right? So if the input is zero, then we are going to just return a list containing an int of ASCII zero, right? Uh, we're doing this because the rest of the algorithm removes preceding zeros, and we want to do that for every number except zero, because otherwise that would just be an empty output, right? Second parameter that's passed if the input is not zero, We'll push back an empty list. We need to push back an empty list because we're going to start inserting characters into that list in the, argument, uh, in the algorithm. And then call this while underscore, right? Semantics of while underscore are you have a predicate. As long as that predicate returns true, you know, this first parameter here, as long as this predicate returns true, it will call this predicate until it reaches continue, at which case it will check this again call this again until it reaches continue, and so on and so forth. Right? This will add to recursion depth, so you can't go too crazy with this. Uh, it could be trampolined. Uh, I've been debating with Heal about how best to do this. But uh, it does work. It's not currently in the uh, development or release fork of the library, if you want to go check. Uh, it's on some experimental branch at this point. But at some point, we will have some way of looping in the library. Um, so what are we actually doing in the loop? The semantics of fork, I'm probably getting ahead of my slides again. Yes, the semantics of fork are take all of the input parameters and pass them to every meta closure in your list except for the last one, right? So if I have three parameters, I will pass all the input parameters to the first and the second. 
and I will pass the returns of the first and the second to the last one, because it's the continuation, right? So why is it not called T? Why is it not called T? Yeah. Because that's what you said. Oh. Well, <laughs> you probably noticed I'm not really a functional programming guy. Uh, no, template no, metaprogram. That's, that's bash. That's ba oh, it's bash. Okay. Then I'm I work on Windows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as nerd as you think I am. I've just been pretending with this whole yeah. <laughs> so Predicate is basically uh, checking if um, dividing by, you know, dividing the input by, uh, uh, sorry, pre predicate is checking if null. Uh, first, first parameter of fork is basically our running remainder number, which we haven't turned into characters yet, right? So every, every step of the way, we want to take that and divide it by 10, right? The second parameter to fork is an each, which is kind of like fork. It takes a variadic pack of uh, meta closures. It will pass one parameter to each of these mega closures in lockstep, and you're expected to pass the same amount of metaprogrammers as the amount of uh, parameters that you're expecting, right? So we are going to get, in the first one, we are going to get our running uh, number, right? Our running remainder that we haven't processed yet. And then the second one, we are going to get our list of characters that we have processed, right? And what we are going to do is we're going to take our running number and we are going to modulo by 10, right? Push uh, 10 to the back, pipe that into modulo, right? Then we are going to add an ASCII 0 to the back of that, push that to the back, pipe that into plus, right? So we're, you know, we, we have a number for the sake of argument 3, that needs to become an ASCII 3, right? And then we're turning this into a list. This will forward the other list. We will join the two lists and pushing to the front of the list of the characters which we have processed so far, right? And we're just going to keep doing that until we're done, until this no longer holds. And then we are going to take the uh, second parameter because at 0 is our running number, which will have gone to 0 by now. At 1 is the list which we uh, um, have processed so far. We're going to unpack that list and pass it to our continuation. Right? If the continuation happens to be listify, we're going to do unpack and then listify, which is essentially no operation because you take it from a list back into a list. Uh, we can actually pattern match against this in specializations of unpack to see if its continuation is listify and do nothing in that case. Right? Because we have essentially uh, uh, you know, a graph of, of all the calls that we're doing, we can do all of the uh, you know, Haskell-ish uh, uh, um, optimizations on this list. And yes? Sorry, can you explain how the stopping condition works for the forking? Yes. Um, you mean how it's implemented? Just how, how does it, like, how is it, yeah, how is it decided? OK, basically, uh, how it's implemented is uh, the while will uh, run essentially a recursive traits class that will go through, look at fork, OK, what's fork's continuation, look at. Oh, it's, OK, it's the while where the test is. Sorry. I, yes. I, I, while is where the so test is. Yes, right. yes, yes. Um, basically, we're, we're going to go through, and then we're going to replace that continue underscore tag with something else. Uh, this would be another way to do loops. As soon as we can replace a tag with something else, we could just basically make a go to and that conditional go to. Uh, there are many ways of implementing it, right? So, uh, you know, the, the crazy people in the audience are going to go, oh my god, I can make an awesome fizz buzz, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, take a sequence which is as big as the parameter you passed in, transform that sequence. If modulo of three and modulo of five, then return fizz buzz, otherwise return fizz because we already know it's modulo of three and Otherwise, test of five. In, oh, this should be a buzz. Damn it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Nobody can write fizz buzz. <laughs> yes, nobody can write fizz buzz. Uh, if it's neither fizz nor buzz, we stringify it. Uh, fizz and buzz and fizz buzz are aliases to a list of characters which are fizz buzz or fizz buzz. We 
uh, you know, that fizzbuzz and fizzbuzz already have a preceding comma. We are going to prepend a comma to our uh, string, and then we're going to drop the first comma off the list. You have a comma-separated list of text of fizzbuzz at compile time, scalable up to probably more than 1,000, <laughs> right? And it fits on a slide, right? But again, this doesn't matter because this is what most of you are doing, right? This doesn't help here much, right? This is actually uh, the most readable constructor that I could find to any optional implementation, right? If you look at the standards library, uh, it's basically like the winner of a code obfuscation contest. Uh, in uh, Upsile, they at least don't uglify everything and so on and so forth. So we have a somewhat comparatively readable constraint <coughs> on, I think this is one of eight constructors that has a Svine constraint in optional. And I already take issue with this pattern to begin with. I mean, it's not trivial to look at eight different Sweeney constructors and say, either zero or one of these will survive. Never two, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and if you think about the, the complexity of actually checking if eight things will Sweeney, uh, that's probably a lot more than checking, what did you want to call in the first place, <laughs> right? <laughs> But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Look, look at sort of what this, what this, what you know, how this is implemented in current template metaprogramming, right? In C++ 17, we got conjunction. Semantics of conjunction are: you take a pack of lazy meta functions, lazy meaning you have to call colon colon type on them to actually perform the operation, as opposed to eager meta functions, which are aliases, which just resolve to the result, right? So you take a pack of lazy meta functions, and you execute these lazy meta functions in a short circuiting way, as in, as, you know, it's basically a short circuiting and, right? As soon as you find one that returns false, you just return false and don't execute the other ones, right? Now there are two reasons you might want to do this. One of them is for speed. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's actually what it does. It inherits from the first one that's false. And uh, that. And you can make it carry state or something. Yes, like yes. Uh, it also makes it slower, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so, there, yeah, there are two reasons why you might want to use a conjunction because A, it might be faster, and B, for correctness. Because if we are testing convertibility and this actually me matches the pattern of our copy constructor, right? Then this trait will be testing our copy constructor of which we are an overload candidate and we have basically recursion at compile time. So we make sure that we're not our copy constructor first before we actually execute that. So it's both for correctness. The question is, is it for speed? Is it actually faster than if we were to just do this, right? This is arguably somewhat more readable, but this is not short circuiting, right? We're calling value on everything, right? Well, we can look at sort of this. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, question is when we're talking about speed, what is the common case, right? If you want to optimize something to go fast, you want to optimize it to go fast in the common case. And this might be somewhat counterintuitive, but I would argue that the common case for this kind of thing is that all of the constructors Sweeney. It is a non-convertible thing, right? If you look at this overload set, I have int and optional of you know, some empty struct called s, and I have int and char, right? If I want to test which one gets called, I could have also called it. It would have been the same effect as this decal type, right? Am I actually instantiating all the constructors of this optional? Yes. I am, because the compiler has to make sure that this is not a candidate in the overload set, right? And so most of what you're actually doing is waiting for things to die, right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like trying to move up the food chain in an old economy company, right? Uh, you're basically just waiting. And it takes a long, long, long time. Uh, because not only are you actually waiting for all of the constructors of that optional to Sfine, 
They're calling things that sphene to decide whether they need to sphene. We'll see in a minute. So in this case, S is, you know, int is not convertible to S. In this case, we don't have to instantiate all the constructs of optional because, and I thought I was going to have to do a bunch of research to find this, and then yesterday there was this awesome lightning talk that just explained lexical order. <laughs> as soon as, if you, you know, if you progress in lexical order, as soon as you find something that disqualifies this function from the overload set, the rest of the things that could be instantiated or sphene or whatever, they are not instantiated and don't sphene, right? So tag dispatch would actually help us here, right? So how far are we going to get in the common case where all the constructors are expected to sphene, right? We're definitely going to do this because you're not going to short circuit before you test anything, right? And on a side note, this is probably one of the most expensive calls in the whole thing, and we're doing this eagerly. <laughs> and it's also the wrong thing. I mean, not only does Upsile do this wrong, uh, I don't remember which of the standard libraries do this wrong, too. You don't actually want a DK. You want to un-CV ref. That's not a trait yet. That hopefully will be in 20. It's a trait in, in the 20. draft. In the draft, yeah, in the draft. And, and yes. The OK, please nobody take that it's out. Not, it's not the implementations that were wrong. It's the standard that was wrong. Yes. Uh, well, you could have. You, we'll get to that in a minute. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, sorry, here at the top, we're testing if it's the same as an in-place t. Well, there's only one in-place t type. So if it doesn't happen to be an in-place t, then we're going to get to here. Right? So that's one in all possible cases. That's definitely not the common case. Uh, we're also testing if it's ourself, right? If we need a sphene away because there is a copy constructor, right? Um, that again, there's only one type of ourselves. That's still probably not the common case. So we're going to test, oops, sorry. Now we're going to get into why decay is wrong. Uh, mentally, slides are in a different order than they actually are. Anyway. So decay is expensive because this is the implementation of decay, right? In decay, we're already removing reference. Well, we definitely have to do that, right? And then we're testing if it's referenceable and doing either this or this, depending on whether or not it's referenceable. And you might think, oh, I'm saving all this most of the time. No, almost everything's referenceable, <laughs> right? So this is going to be the common case. OK, so we're, we're in conditional. Well, conditional supports short circuiting, right? You know, I can say conditional of this or that, and then say type and then type at the end, right? <laughs> because you gave me one of those two types, and then I want to call the type on that, right? Uh, except that if you look at this tree of conditionals, we have on one side something that will have one type, and on the, on the other side something that will have two types. So it's kind of a lopsided balance of amount of types that you need to call at the end. So in this case, we can't really be short circuiting and conditional. In this case, we probably could have been short circuiting and conditional. But look, they're calling type and value everywhere. So nothing here is short circuiting, right? Uh, is array is a specialization that's somewhat fast. Is function sphene in its implementation uh, to test if it's a function, right? Uh, as does uh, is referenceable. So we basically have two sphene to test if something else can sphene it, <laughs> right? Um, and you actually don't need any of that crap, because uh, if it's uh, you know, an, an, an array, it's definitely not going to, you know, an array is definitely not going to be an optional of t, right? <laughs> uh, all we need to do is remove qualifiers and reference, you know, CV qualifiers and references, right? So yeah, sorry, these are all, uh, so, so Instead of decay, what should I write, right? Remove reference, remove CV, nested like this. That would be good, except for you're going to confuse a bunch of people with the type type, right? There's actually even <laughs> one more type, which negation is calling, <laughs> right? And you're, so missing the type, type. you're missing a type name, right? Yes, I'm missing a type name. And Shit. <laughs> I think you need to remove you have reference to, before you remove. You should have the type inside it. I think. 
angle break. Oh yeah, you have a It's called uncv ref, which would you mean have a bias because because if you if a reference is never a cons or follow up bias. Yes, you need to remove reference first. You need to remove reference first, and only then you can remove cons follow up bias. Yes. Okay, so my so point that this is complicated <laughs> is actually <laughs> paying off. And also, your removed reference doesn't do anything because it removes reference from the thing with those three Ds, which is not never a reference. That's right. Uh, I can't be lazy <laughs> there. <laughs> but then it wouldn't be lazy anymore. It wouldn't oh, be yeah, short circuiting. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, uh, I tried and failed to make the short circuiting. You could make your like your own new type that calls this in a short circuity manner. But my point is, it's hard to make things actually short circuit. Even though we tried in the library to make things short circuitable, uh, it's actually hard to do, right? So we are basically going to reach here, right? Is convertible. Right? So, so this conjunction, in the case that we're not convertible, is going to save us testing is constructible on this constructor. Because there's also the explicit version of this, which tests the negation of is convertible. And so it, one of the two cases we are going to reach is constructible. Right? It probably would have been better to swap those around and test is constructible first, and then is convertible to figure out if we want to be explicit or not. Uh, it would be even awesomer if we had a uh, conditional explicit, which I hope, again, nobody takes out of C++20. We really need that, right? You know, the same way we have conditional no except, because it basically means that for every constructor of variant, of optional, of tuple, we have all of the constructors that may or may not need to be explicit. We have two of them, two of each, and we spinate exactly one of those two every time. Right? <laughs> so, yay. yeah. <laughs> yay, metaprogramming. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, basically. Not even metaprogramming. Yes, well, yeah, this is, this is, this is metaprogramming for the non addicted user. Yes. Uh, so, this conjunction is basically not saving us anything in this case. It is for correctness and not for speed. And I did a little research. Uh, a little research meaning I griped on Twitter and looked at all the examples that people gave me, which were about 10 and from pretty high profile people. But uh, it's almost always about correctness. It's hardly ever about speed because conjunction actually takes up time being lazy, right? Oops, sorry, this is the, the other constructor. Yeah. Um, so if we think about, okay, how, you know, how much time are we paying? in order to be short circuiting, right? You know, this is, this is some generic traits class. It, this is pseudo code. It's going to either derive from true type or false type, depending on whether the traits is true or not, right? And in the standard, we also have a alias to, which is mandated to be, you know, this trait, colon, colon, type, right? Uh, uh, this makes no sense. Hmm? This true or false, and you are Yeah, it's it's it's, it's pseudocode, so it's going to be either true type or false type. In that, I probably should have made that clear. Yeah, but true type or false and false type don't have a bias anyway. Yes, they do. I'm pretty sure they do. It's just themselves. So you can just say yeah. call type 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 on them indefinitely. Uh, yes, uh, that means that in some cases where you do have a lopsided type situation, you can just call types a, a bunch of times and it'll work out because once they get to the true type or false type, you can just call type as often as you want, right? So this is kind of, you know, okay. patching around and, yeah. Uh, so the thing is, modern compilers have intrinsics for this kind of thing, right? I mean, is same is an incredibly fast operation. You basically say, give me two pointers to the AST. Are those two pointers the same? Yes or no, right? I mean, there is a little uh, you know, time that's probably taken up of making sure are these actually types that you're passing me and not something else. But yes, is same goes incredibly fast. Can we profit from that? Not really, because we have to make a type for every permutation of T and U, right? <laughs> could, could, could we do this, right? Could we just say bool constant there's two of those. It'll be memoized after you know, both calls and not memoize every combination of T and U. Well, not quite, because it is somehow a little bit observable whether or not. Like, if you made a uh, is same 
and then wanted to test if that thing that you just made is that thing that you just made and not an alias that alias is something else, right? But in Boost TMP, we don't have to, we don't care what the standard says, we can actually do this, right? We can actually package this up into a callable object, right? We can give it a continuation. We can make a same as where one of the parameters is fixed just for convenience, right? And these things are going to go faster than the standard library versions, right? How much faster? This much faster, right? Uh, this is the same operation, uh, alias version, standard library version, right? That's about, what, uh, 6x, 5x, something like that, right? But you might say, OK, but the standard library version is memoized, right? If I call is same the first time, I'm going to be creating a type. If I call it the second time, it's just type, look, type lookup. Aren't you going to be eventually slower if you're calling an alias? Well, let's test this. Let's call, you know, this is, this is calling everything 50,000, you know, calling the operation 50,000 times which uh, definitely made me notice that with stickers on my laptop, the cooling is not as good as without stickers on my laptop. Um, <laughs> but it's with 50,000 different types, right? So let's say that's each... That's like 500,000, right? Uh, yes, 500,000. Sorry, uh, I can't read my own slides. Um, again, you know, this access is time it took, and this access is how many, right? So let's call each of them 10 times with the same type, right? Uh, here's the standard library, got about 10x faster. We didn't really change, right, with our alias version. Again, 100 times each. Okay, we're getting a little noisy here. Uh, I'm not sure why. I think this is just like uh, quantum physics-y stuff or, you know, noise. I, I think this should be here, right? I don't think it should go faster if I call the same alias a million times, right? It might be... I don't know, branch prediction starting to fire or whatever. It's probably just a property of the benchmark rather than actual property of the library. But the takeaway here is this one's coming down in sort of an asymptotic, uh, 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 damn German, <laughs> no, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's going towards this one, right? And this one's staying, you know, modulo noise, uh, essentially flat, right? So you will, if you call this thing often enough, maybe get into somewhere close to the same speed, but you will never be faster, right? And again, what's the common case, right? If, you know, if I call uh, same as in some constructor of my tuple, then uh, if I call that constructor again, same as is actually not called in both cases because the compiler already knows that thing doesn't sphene. It already instantiated the function template. So, you know, the number of instantiations of any particular trait is not that high, right? Because something outside already memoized, and so the compiler is short-circuiting past that test anyway. So, the things in this conjunction take a lot more time than they need to, and it's hard to make them actually short-circuit, right? What about the conjunction itself, right? The way conjunction is currently implemented is, you know, conjunction of n things derives from conjunction of n minus 1 things derives from conjunction of n minus 2 things. So uh, you're creating a lot of types in instantiating conjunction, which I think you don't actually need to do, right? So for my benchmarking, I'm going to do this toy example of just because, you know, we, we have experience with is same. I mean, this will obviously never be true but we are passing to this conjunction something that is also not an int. So it's going to short circuit on the very first uh, call to conjunction, right? Which, if you wrote things right, would probably be the common case, right? Because remember, the common case is everything Sweeney's, at least in my opinion, right? So let's benchmark this against my implementation. Uh, sorry, let's, let's look at, uh, you know, we, we have four package tasks, if you will, right? We have a is same this and that, is same this and some other thing, is same this and some other thing. They're lazy because we're not calling colon colon type or colon colon value, right? But packaging them up creates a, ta a type. So that costs something, right? So here we have calling is same once, 
here we have calling this conjunction. You know, it's for all intents and purposes a little more than four times as much time, especially if you count in something small like this, amount of time for actually calling that is same intrinsic. So how good can we do? Uh, if you look down at the bottom here, um, conjunction derives from an alias, uh, 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 from, from uh, conjunct if with selector of true or false, colon, colon, template. We need a template disambiguator to get at this nested alias with all the t's, right? And so in case t colon colon value is true, we are going to recurse, passing one less input. If it's false, we are just going to resolve to that t, therefore deriving from that t. I'm convinced that this is a standards conforming implementation of conjunction. How much faster is it? It's somewhat faster, right? But here you can see cost of calling is same, cost of calling the intrinsic. Essentially, here we have cost of packaging is same, right? If you take cost of packaging is same times four, you get to about here, right? So my super fast conjunction takes this much time, right? The lazy metafunction public interface of packaging all these is sames and creating those types takes all the rest of the time, right? So again, laziness is taking up time, right? Uh, what if we did this as ifs? Right? Uh, if is actually slightly faster than any of that, right? I would also argue it's somewhat more readable. However, we can also optimize if, right? We, we, we can see, okay, my if predicate is something that may have an intrinsic, right? And I didn't actually have time to make this slide because I only thought of this opportunity yesterday. Uh, <laughs> we can take uh, um, we can take this uh, intrinsic. We can't take its address, and it's not a type, so we can't really pass it around. But we can make an alias to this intrinsic, which takes uh, input, and then the type I want when it's true, and the type I want when it's false. In the default case, this would be true type, false type. And then in the implementation, say, type pack element, Louis intrinsic for finding the index in a, in a uh, type pack. Then next parameter, intrinsic, then the two types, right? Yes? You want to write that out on the blackboard? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> that was a good idea. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, white, chalk. white chalk. Not readable? Good enough. Good enough? Intrinsic, I'm running out of room. True type, false type. The, okay. The right side is where you can't read. What yes. Uh, so the implementation of this uh, intrinsic y thingy, right, of this, uh, um, of this uh, traits class is type pack element, which is an intrinsic, which takes uh, the index of a pack of types. In this case, I'm passing through the type you want for true type, the type you want for false type. And in the index, I'm just calling intrinsic, because it's going to give me back 0 or 1. 0 case, I take this type. 1 case, I take that type. Blazingly fast, right? So I can pattern match against this uh, intrinsic implementation, saying, OK, do I know what type you're going to resolve to in true case and false type case? and get around the next conditionally kind of thing, right? You never really want the result as a true type, false type. What do you do with a true type, false type? OK, maybe tag dispatch. But the vast majority of the cases, in true type, you're going to do something. In false type, you're going to do something else. So we can short circuit across that. And in my uh, initial benchmarks, which I just ran comparing these two and was somewhat noisy, so it's not on the slide, I got down to about here, 
right? But again, that doesn't matter because this is a much more powerful paradigm. I don't have to make a chain like this. I can also make a tree, right? I can also put more ifs down here and just make a tree which decides which tag or which overload did you really want to call, right? I'm going to be calling less predicates, you know, less, less uh, 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 traits on things to get from root to leaf of tree than to get uh, through uh, the um, conjunctions of, you know, in the case of tuple, something like 30 different constructors, <laughs> right? So as you can see in the constructor of optional, we are actually already tag dispatching to the constructor of our base, right? We wouldn't have to change the implementation all that much to just calculate that in place tag, right, in some tree and, you know, some, some if tree. We could also make a tag, or there already is in the library, a tag called nothing, right? We could make an alternative to call that's called, I don't know, for the sake of argument, dispatch. Semantics of dispatch are basically you call is same as cheap, but it's an intrinsic. We test, are you the same as nothing? If yes, Svina deck, right? In that case, we're a lot faster. Let's go look at cost of uh, Svine. Okay, yeah, sorry. This is my implementation of this tree. I'm running a little short on time, so we're just, you're just going to have to believe me that you can make a tree of that. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, so in this, in this tree, uh, we are uh, passing in T and U, right? The T and U that we knew from the previous one. U is coming in through the university uh, user interface. T is actually the type of our optional, right? In this case, we are remove referencing on the first one. We are wrapping the second one in optional. CFE basically means wrap it in this thing, or basically literally means here's something that matches the uh, signature of a template template, and you just put arguments into that thing, and whatever it does, that's what your result is, right? So we can use CFE to wrap this in optional. So we have optional T on this hand. We have remove ref, removes. No, I did this wrong way again. I should have done ref and then CV, apparently. I'm still confused. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> No, Un-CV ref. Those are continuations, right? Yes, so this so, one's. So CV is a continuation for Yes, so this is happening and first, and then this is happening. Right so, so I'm the right way around in this yeah, case. This yes, here. yes, right? The continuation of these two, we're passing this to a fork. On the one hand, we are testing if these two are the same. On the other hand, we're selecting the first one, as in the un-CV ref thing, and we're testing if it's the same as in place T. And those two results we're piping into OR. So if it's one of those two, right, then die, because there's an in-place T and a constructor, which is not part of this Svinang overload set. So we just need to die in that case. We don't want to attack dispatch to the uh, base constructor. Otherwise, we test is constructible. Convertible needs the argument in the same order, so we rotate one. <laughs> and then call is convertible, right? Uh, in this case, we are going to return true or false, depending on whether that's true or false. Otherwise, we're going to die if there's not either of them, right? Uh, and we are going to just, uh, oops, I, there should be a tag dispatch here on true or false, right? And in this case, you know, we can, we can, we can have one big tree test for all the constructors. In the common case where nothing matches, we just die, and we only had to execute something once, right? You might say, OK, that's a whole lot of types that you're creating. Well, this is probably already being used by someone else in the library outside of optional. This is definitely going to be used by somebody outside of optional. This is definitely going to be used by somebody else. This is definitely going to be used by somebody else. This is definitely blah, 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 right? Um, even in the case of all, all the rest is just unique to optional, right? Doesn't matter how many different kinds of optional you have, you pay for the rest just once, right? After that, it's memoized. Because these two types that are different in different occasions, they're only going in through aliases, right? So if you look at comparing this to one constructor, we have U, which is a type passed in all over the place, right? So even if this stuff here is memoized, 
in the current implementation, because this is lazy, this type is going to infect all of the base classes of conjunction, because it's in their signature, and it's different for different U's. And so you're going to be instantiating a bunch of different types, even though you've already memoized some of these results. right? So again, being short-circuiting is not for speed. <laughs> right? Now, before we get into Sveenane things, I wanted to clear something up. Uh, Eric Niebler filed a bug recently that got a lot of attention from the addicted TMP people that uh, Sveenane is a parameter, in this case, tparam as opposed to Sveenane in the return is a 10x difference. And I benched this in a bunch of scenarios. Notice that this is a friend function of some thing. This is, this is like a very corner case example. Don't stop using tparam. Because in my benchmarks, uh, where I basically benchmarked two functions, one of which will die, one of which will live, right? Question is always, what do you benchmark? What's the common case? This might not be the common case, but at least it's easy to understand. I have tparam as actually the fastest of the three ways, right? tparam means you have a default parameter in your parameter pack, and you assign it something that can sfine as a default type, right? You can also have uh, um, a uh, um, template argument whose type you get back from your possibly sweening thing and assign it true or false, right? Usually it's a bool, and that's called like the B param idiom, right? So T param faster than B param, faster than sweening in the return. Also more clear, because then you see what it actually returns, right? So don't stop doing that. But tag dispatch, right? In the case where I'm just figuring out the tag and dispatching to one of them, is faster than sweening. Right? Um, especially in the case, I mean, this is the case where one of, the, one of them survived, right? If they all died in the Sveenay case, it would arguably be even faster than this. So if we look at uh, tuple, I had to actually even find the name tuple to make sure it was on the right slide, right? This is, this is happening not just in optional. This is happening all over the standard library, all over your libraries. As soon as there's a lot of constructors, I mean, tuple has, I think, 18 constructors, but something like 12 of them can be explicit or not, so they essentially have 30 constructors. Uh, there, there, uh, SCR once tuple said uh, tuple has 30 constructors, and in a, in a sense, it has an infinite number of constructors, but an infinite number would actually be better than well, STL's implementation of tuple has a lot more constructors than normal people's implementation of tuple because STL derives from tuple itself with all of the top level checking recursively with one less type. The other standard libraries do this much more sanely and therefore they only have 30 while STL essentially for an infinitely sized tuple has an infinite number of constructors. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, here's another tuple. No, notice, sorry, notice in, in tuple, again, we're also di tag dispatching to the constructor of a base class. We're doing that in most constructors in tuple, right? So the infrastructure is almost already there to just do, you would have to modify some things, right? But, yeah, this is, this is already a common item. I even if you don't have a ba base class, which you are tag dispatching to the constructor of, you can still tag dispatch to a private delegating constructor, right? And still just have one top level public Sveenay thing. So, what is the. Uh, can you go back for a second? Uh, one more. Where is the alloc arg t at some point already mentioned? The alloc arg t. Do you, do you know it, guys? Or? I think this is. Uh, because immediately after that, we are checking if it's allocator baker RT. That's true. Oh no, some somebody somebody you know that that's just a placeholder for this type, right? No, 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 but, but it's a template argument to this function or a template parameter, and we are immediately checking if it's allocator RT. Well, this is basically a binary function that will eat anything whose second parameter is a const ref, right? So if I have a tuple and I'm constructing it with int and bool, then this will be int, right? And so they're checking if it actually is yeah, int. No, no. What, what I mean is why the first parameter of the function... Why don't they just make it fixed, you mean? Yeah. 
that's a good question. That's true. Yeah, there's probably another one that says explicit. Uh, yes. Uh, it's fun. Not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, coming back to uh, STL's terrible tuple implementation, which they can't change now because of binary compatibility, they can't even make it better anymore. Uh, I mean, the other thing um, that's terrible about that tuple implementation is it implements all, you know, lays out the types of memory backwards. So if you want to be smart and put, you know, the, you know, the type that you're always accessing to be the front of the tuple so that cache is hot, it's going to be the front of the tuple on the two standard libraries that have the same tuple, and it's going to be the back of the tuple in Microsoft's version, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I mean, basically the layout of a tuple is essentially this, right? You have some base class that actually holds the type, right? You can't derive unless it's not final and blah, 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 and it doesn't buy you anything unless it's empty, and we'll get to that. You have some base class that derives uh, um, as a pack from all of these holder thingies. You generate your derivy with some metaprogram, and your top-level tuple derives from that, right? So you create type and index as a derivy. That thing holds a data member. You pack, you know, you in your constructor, you just pack a span things into that. And none of the tuple implementations are quite that good, right? Uh, um, I think Clang's actually does use this, so it's not recursive in that sense. So it is pretty scalable. I mean, again, this is mostly for crazy people that want to build tuples of more than like a thousand types. There are some weird physics PhD type people that want to do, you know, matrix math on heterogeneous matrices and are using tuple for this. Uh, we can also make a, sorry, for the, for the, for the tuple cat example, however, uh, Clang standard library is not that scalable if you want to cat a lot of tuples together that gets slow fast, right? So you can make a essentially 2D selector thing, which you know, as its first parameter says, okay, I am this base class of the tuple of tuples, right? And then I am this element in that tuple. You can, through TMP with this library, create a 2D matrix, right? I, I do not have a whole lot of time. Uh, create a 2D matrix of these, um, basically making uh, a, an integral sequence the size of the number of tuples passed to you, and then making a pack of integral sequences the size of each tuple in that pack given to you. Cartesian product gives you a 2D index into that pack of tuples, right? In the implementation, you just pack expand uh, your list of indexes which you created with the, you know, wrapper around all the inputs, which is kind of like a tuple, but not a tuple so that it compiles fast, right? And then you can get a thousand X better performance of tuplecat, right? Uh, so the thing is, this would be very hard to write in any other library, right? That's the reason why the you know, Clang standard library did something different. Uh, my point is with this infrastructure, you can write complex metaprograms somewhat simply, and in the vast majority of cases, more performant than you could write yourself. Right? Uh, you know, even, we, you know, because we, we cheat with intrinsics, because we can cheat with intrinsics, because we wrap the interface, right? Because we can look at all the things that you are doing, and we can uh, optimize based on looking down the chain of things that you're doing. You can't do that in any other library because we do it backwards, right? We see, uh, you know, if, if, if I specialize a, uh, um, uh, an operation on what the next operation is, I can do that because I can see the next operation, right? And yeah, that only works with this uh, 
paradigm. Now, I promised to get into the future a bit uh, of where I think this library could go. I'm somewhat debating whether this should go into the boost proposal or this should be a, an add-on to the boost library. Because as Louis pointed out correctly, sometimes you want to do type-based stuff. Sometimes you want to work on in sort of a fusion-y way on compile time and runtime parameters. Right? Um, the problem with HANA there is the public interface costs a lot. Right? Every time you call a function in HANA, it's returning a tuple. That means you have to make an intermediate tuple for every step in the process. It is a HANA tuple, it's not a standard tuple, and it's definitely not a Microsoft standard library standard tuple, right? So it's gonna be a lot faster. But you still have to make that tuple. You also can't look down the chain. Also, your predicates uh, are always lambdas, right? So you have to instantiate a generic lambda for every operation. If you're sorting something, that's going to be fun, right? <laughs> you're going to instantiate a lot of combinations of different elements in your uh, in your sort algorithm, right? So what I think, you know, how I think this this needs to be written is we need to separate the algorithms or operations which you can only do based on compile time known data, right? You can't actually sort a tuple of things based on runtime known data, right? Because what would the types and the result be, right? Well, you can't. It's a variant of an exponential number of possibilities. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, granted, granted. But who's that crazy? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in sort of normal uh, um, normal code, uh, you're not going to, I mean, even crazy people code, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to be sorting this tuple based on type information, right? So that sort predicate, that doesn't have to be a lambda, where you're just decal typing the return anyway, right? We can, we can filter, you know, filter as with sort. Uh, it's got to be on compile time known data. Right? So why can't we just go through and give all of the operations that we know from uh, this tacit metaprogramming library that only worked on types so far, give them a bunch of default parameters so that you can instantiate all of them with nothing, right? And say, okay, in the case where you instantiated with nothing, you have a constructor, <laughs> right? So we can construct a call with, uh, oh, sorry, in the case of call, it would have to be a, a, um, a function uh, operator. But in the, uh, the, the other cases, it's a constructor, right? So we make, uh, um, so we can do normal, uh, you know, tacit uh, style uh, uh, operations when we are only working on types, as is the case with filter. But then we can, you know, sort of rangy-like pipe that into the next thing in this transform, we're actually doing a runtimey thing, right? But we don't actually have to do that eagerly, right? I mean, what we're going to do is we're going to compile in an expression template way all of this together into one big blob. We can do optimizations on it and so on and so forth, right? Um, we are going to make a tuple of all the runtimey stuff that was passed to us, right? Uh, in this case, it's it's a it's a lambda without a capture. Uh, so if you could, if you were allowed to construct those again, <laughs> you would just have to remember the type. But you're not. I guess there are tricks that I guess are a gray area where you can do that again. But uh, even you know, in the case where it had a capture, we'd have to store that somewhere. So we store one tuple full of runtimey parameters that are passed to the algorithms. We store one tuple of all the input arguments. And those things get created once, and after that, we just work with indexes of those, right? So we have to rebind all of these uh, algorithms and predicates and whatnot in order to also work in the case where I have, you know, a, a 
pair of index and type. And when I'm doing type operations, I have to extract the type and then do the operation on that rather than doing it on the whole type, right? Because we have to attach the index somehow of where this thing came from, right? Uh, but again, because we don't say what the implementation is, right? If you want to write your own custom thing and then hoist it into this uh, uh, meta closure world, then you wrap it in a CFE, right? You make an year meta function, wrap it in a CFE. You don't have to make lazy meta functions because the library itself is lazy, right? It, it, you know, if, if, if the if branch doesn't point to you, that alias will never see a type, right? So you don't have to worry about la being lazy. It's lazy by default, right? You can hoist your eager meta functions into this world, but how this world works under the hood is undefined, right? Which allows us to do this kind of thing, right? So, so we filter. Basically, that means I have a pack of index and type from that original tuple that has less things in it, potentially, right? That's purely a type-based operation. Those types never see anywhere except for aliases. I guess some operations, we can't quite do that. But that's the ideal, right? They never actually get instantiated as the parameter to a type, right? Um, when we add, you know, pin things on here in the transform case, well, why don't we just pin that action onto there and say, if this type survives the rest of the chain, then this is the first thing you're going to do to it, <laughs> right? Here's the index into the tuple of actions, right? And so we can just build up this action chain in a very lazy way. And then at top level in co call, when you actually want the result, then we just go through the action chain of all of those and execute all of those runtimey things in order, right? Has the advantage of being tacit syntax, very much the same syntax as template metaprogramming type-based world. And it's, you know, my initial benchmarks of sort of proof of conceptinesses of this, it's at least an order of magnitude faster than HANA, right? Um, it's also easier on the optimizer because all those intermediate steps in HANA don't have to die, right? It's nicer in debug mode. Um, it doesn't generate millions of symbols. It won't bloat your symbols table. It won't bloat your types as much as HANA. And uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the cool thing that almost works is, as I said before, is same as a cheap operation. I could test if the result of this thing has all the same type. Wait a minute, did somebody unplug me? My laptop's going to die. I am plugged into the power strip. What the hell? OK, I guess I'm just going to have to go really fast before my laptop dies. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, where was I? Yes, the cool thing that almost works, I could say the result of that uh, of, of, of that whole operation, when we actually need to be greedy, is that resulting in the same type everywhere, right? In this case, uh, oh, in this case we're folding, so it's, but if we were to, you know, lop these two off and say, okay, a dot f, does f always return the same thing? Is it like two string or something? Well, let's make that into a vector, or sorry, a standard array, rather than a tuple, because then you could just pipe range, range v3 things onto the end of this. The problem is that this is a temporary, and they don't go into range v3 very well. So you would have to make a local copy. But then, you know, you could just do heterogeneous, heterogeneous, and once all your types are the same, then you can just pipe that into a ranges v3 operation. Right? So I wanted to leave a little time uh, at the end for some discussion about whether people think this has potential, whether people like this. Obviously, if people have questions, and I mean, it is another metaprogramming library in Boost, right? Like, how many do you need? But I think there is, uh, you know, some unique sales proposition to this. Yes. Question? Yeah. So I'm going to say that we need the, the heterogeneous stuff to do Argo, right? Yes. That's probably why I didn't write it last year. <laughs> 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 it's my fault. <laughs> okay, you flipped it on me. Um, 
that's true. Argo would run way faster with that. Yeah, and the hello world wouldn't be like 32K. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, if you look at this, uh, all of the, all of the types that are, you know, part of the intermediate expression template operations, those can just go away, right? They don't actually end up in the function signature of anything, right? They're going to be used in some pack expansion somewhere as temporaries, which have, you know, no address ever, blah, blah, blah. The compiler can just forget those. Those aren't going into the binary, right? So basically you have beginning tuple and tuple, <laughs> right? Rather than many, many, many intermediate tuples and many, many, many intermediate operators and stuff. Other questions? I was expecting a lot more. <laughs> Yeah, oops. OK, uh, yes? Uh, I know it's not just method branch, but if someone who's like not a grant seeker, yeah. it would be really helpful or maybe even interesting to see, like with some of the other examples you showed earlier, yeah. the way you write it procedurally and how you get to the, the notation that you have. Oh, I yes. Think, I think push back and like the way that you're using the how push back and push get operate is the most confusing thing I've done. Uh, yes, that is that is kind of a brain fuck. Um, it's, just it, it, it's like this is this is like organized in a linear functional way, but that kind of like it, it that also just does it, it kind of like operates on this, on this like implied state and on that. I guess. Yes, yes. Uh, why is my clicker not working anymore? Why is nothing working anymore? Okay, let's go back to a pushback y example. Um, uh, there should be a pushback in here somewhere. Nope. I really like the two string example. Yeah, okay, let's go back to two string. Way back at the beginning. Oh, yes. Um, so yes, here we are. Uh, so this fork is going to get uh, past two parameters, right? First parameter is going to be, you know, the 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 number that we're counting down, you know, or dividing by ten recurs you know, again and again and again until it's zero, and the other parameter is the a list of all the characters which we have already converted, right? And so at zero will give us the first parameter of those two, right? So piping into the next thing is the one parameter, the first par you know, the first parameter in the pack, uh, which is the number we're counting down, okay. right? And then divide takes two parameters, right? So somewhere between at zero and divide, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's weird that it doesn't work here, because I'd imagine all this other stuff must yeah. have power. <laughs> Although it's probably going to take me the rest of the time to boot up and get to that slide again anyway. <laughs> I think this is generally a problem with points free programming. Though. Yes, uh, yes. You lose context extremely quickly, and so yeah, yeah. Th those points are extremely useful for humans to see what the hell's going on. Yeah. Um, that is true. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of shit talking about Haskell point free, which is basically the same paradigm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the core of the shit talking is basically calling it pointless rather than point free. Uh, it is hard, however, um, that example where you're converting something to string in a DSL at compile time is way more complicated than it's going to be in most cases, right? right? right. Um, sort of the way I picture it in my mind, I sort of have this just uh, tree of parameters flowing from here to there, and then you manipulate them, and okay, next station, manipulate them, next station. Uh, I have had people with the same reaction saying, okay, I will never understand this, and then after an hour they do, mm -hmm. right? I, you know, I, I, 
I haven't had people yet which I could not teach it to. If you want to volunteer, <laughs> we could do it. Yes, Gasper. I think it would help to just comment which parameters we're doing with. Yes. Because point C is really nice when you already understand it because then it's like super clear because you're not encumbered by all of those pesky points. Right? <laughs> it's like, oh, these are the transformations. Yes, of course, it makes perfect sense. But then you look at it after a month and you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Um, so having just the comments on the side, like yes. this takes these parameters and yeah. this is how they flow is really much easier to remember it and then you have the, that, yes, that's what I, I, think I is the problem. I actually did that pretty extensively in the introduction to this library talk, which was Code Dive last year. It's on YouTube. Um, yeah, I you know I did transformations commenting exactly what's happening in the flow along the way. Um, I uh, in that talk at the end I presented a tuple implementation which actually sorts its members by alignment, therefore being a alignment respecting packed tuple, which for the embedded domain is actually useful and not just an intellectual, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and it, it is relatively trivial, right? Like you have your, your base classes and you just sort them. And then you need, I mean, you need to swizzle the types going into uh, the constructor, right? Which basically means you make a primitive tuple of references to all of those types and then you just swizzle them. Right, which we are going to do use in Argo too. <laughs> Argo, for context, was last year's library in the week idea of, um, let's see, named and deduced and whatever uh, parameters. Yeah. The, the point really was that once you have named parameters in a language like C++, you really want them in order to tag parameters going in. Because yeah you have several and you don't care which order they are because they're semantically tagged. Yeah. Right now. Um, and when you do that, you run into the Sean Parent's talk of, uh, I have, you know, width and height and aspect ratio and I can deduce the third from either of those two. Um, and it's really annoying to have to write all of the several various ways of getting all three. Uh, where you can just give the production rules and have it the algorithm figure it out for you. Um, and you can do that at compile time at the call site. Um, only one of those graphs is going to get, you know, instantiated, and it turns out that it turns literally into, like, three assembly instructions because all you're doing is, like, switching the order of your parameters. Or converting in some cases, but yeah. Or converting. Yeah. yeah, in which case you would be converting otherwise, right? You'd be converting before the call site rather than at the call yes, site. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would also give us the ability to uh, express um, the sort of quadratic explosion of constructor possibilities, yeah. as is the case with tuple. Um, I mean, if you think about the constructors of tuple, they're basically brute force instantiating out all of the possible combinations that would make sense, right? Why can't I turn that into an algorithm and just have one, <laughs> right? One set of rules, uh, you know, the, the, the rules for which the standard committee decided how many are, are uh, uh, proper for that, just expressed in code. Yeah. Would also allow me to put mixins under that for the people that were at yesterday's talk. Because, uh, I mean, one, one problem with tuple and all of the other allocator aware types is that you have the ordered parameters and then you have one semantically tagged parameter which is the allocator in the call system, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you need to figure out if you have one and what the hell it is, right? Um, yeah. And the order, realistically, like which parameter is the allocator shouldn't matter, but it does because you don't really have no mechanism of tagging. Well, it shouldn't matter unless you have a tuple full of allocators. Yes. <laughs> and in that case, you should be able to mark the one you need. Yes. With a name parameter, right? The idea is that uh, you, know, you mark things that are name parameters which would otherwise be ambiguous. And this is actually not super new. The you know, boost parameter <laughs> uh, 
I'm not sure if anybody knows that that's in Boost. It's used in the graph library extensively. I'm not sure it's used anywhere else. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it also does that, right? Like if, if they are uniquely convertible, then they do not need to be named, right? And, and one, you know, as we go into a more statically typed uh, method of programming, right? If we're all using Yonatan's library, where we have you know, strong aliases and whatnot, you shouldn't have a lot of parameters which are the same type or convertible, right? Because essentially, nothing's an int, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, that's a good except way, for except for ints, right? Yeah, no, but uh, uh, you know, any int in the parameter to a function is probably asking for misuse of that function, especially if there are multiple ints in that function, right? Uh, they're a thing, they're a height, they're a width, they're a, I don't know, Z order, they're a length, they're a something. And so if they are all statically typed as a something, uh, you should be able to just throw them at the function and it just figures out which order. Yeah, okay, so that was my talk. Thank everybody. <clears throat>